in uh, your planting and agricultural field. So how did ancient agriculturists achieve uh, these major transformations? Well, there's an archaeological record of corn. So you see the first evidence of sort of corn-like maize cobs uh, appearing maybe six to, thousand, six to 9,000 years ago. Those can actually uh, be dated. The earliest sites are in uh, southern Mexico near the sites uh, where wild teosinte grows. That's one form of archaeology. There's another type that can be done. This is genetic archaeology. Okay, so in an attempt to try to identify the key genetic events that are responsible for the major differences between teosinte and corn, you can actually today set up crosses between the original wild ancestor and today's uh, highly derived derivative. The plants are still so closely related to each other that you can generate fertile F1 hybrids. And in the next few slides, teosinte chromosomes will be shown in red, maize chromosomes will be shown in blue. So you cross these two different plants, and in the first generation, the F1 uh, hybrids, you'll have one teosinte and one maize chromosome for uh, every chromosome in the plant. If you intercross those uh, F1 hybrids to generate a grandchild or second generation, an F2 generation, you'll start to put together different chromosome combinations based on uh, uh, Mendel's laws. So as you all know from your genetics classes, for a simple Mendelian trait, you uh, typically will take from the hybrids uh, randomly either the teosinte or the maize chromosome, so a red type or a blue type, in the uh, seeds and the pollen of each hybrid. You put them back together uh, during fertilization to generate uh, the F2 uh, grandchildren that are shown in the squares. A quarter of the offspring will randomly inherit uh, two teosinte-like chromosomes. Another quarter of the offspring will inherit uh, two maize-like chromosomes. So uh, in this grandchild generation, you're generating uh, different combinations that bring back together some of the chromosomes of the originals or uh, still a mixture of uh, maize and teosinte-like like chromosomes. Okay, so that principle can be used to try to roughly estimate the number of genetic factors that underlie the major architectural differences uh, between maize and teosinte. So in the simplest possible world, if all of the differences between maize and teosinte were due to a simple Mendelian gene, you'd expect when you did one of these crosses that 25% of the uh, F2, the grandchildren plants, would look like either the maize or the teosinte parents. Okay, it turns out it's not that simple. Uh, so what would happen if the differences were controlled by two genes? So you had to have two different genes on different chromosomes together to produce the differences. Well then, instead of seeing maize or teosinte in a quarter of the offspring, you would see them in one quarter by one quarter, uh, or one sixteenth of the offspring. So that's the chance of getting two maize-like chromosomes at gene number one and two maize-like chromosomes uh, at gene number two, for example. Three genes, it gets even worse. A quarter by a quarter by a quarter is one sixty-fourth, four genes, etc. So the major conclusion from these kinds of tables is that if the genetic differences between forms are controlled by a large number of genes, it's very difficult to get all of the chromosomes back together in the right combination to regenerate the parental traits when you do this sort of uh, genetic crossing. So you're down to one in thousands if the traits are controlled uh, by, by uh, lots of genes. Conversely, if traits are controlled by relatively few genes, then you'll regenerate uh, parental-like phenotypes in a substantial fraction of the offspring, as many as 25% for a simple Mendelian character. Okay, George Beadle actually carried out a very large uh, cross of this uh, type. He raised 50,000 F2 grandchildren from a cross between maize and teosinte. And what he found was that about 1 500th of the plants looked like the maize or the teosinte parent. And that suggests something on the order between four and five genes that might be involved in controlling uh, the dramatic differences in plant architecture and, and, and seeds. So what are these genes? Well, geneticists can now do lots more than just calculate ratios. In fact, sophisticated uh, genetic maps have been developed for all of the chromosomes uh, in maize. You can do these sorts of crosses and isolate DNA samples from uh, each of the, uh, the F2 plants measure all of the traits in the plants, and then type those DNA samples with molecular markers that make it possible to monitor whether a given plant inherited teosinte-like or maize-like uh, uh, chromosomes for any marker in the genome. When you do that, what you find is that there are particular chromosomes regions that control particular aspects of uh, plant morphology. So there's a chromosome region that controls flowering, one for branch pattern, open seeds. 
Uh, these aren't min simple Mendelian traits. In fact, uh, there's usually a major gene that controls a lot of the difference and uh, a few minor genes. But it's now also possible when you've mapped a major factor that goes to a particular chromosome region to reach into that chromosome region, sequence the DNA uh, found in an area that's controlling a given trait, identify all of the genes in that region, and try to find the particular candidate genes that may actually be uh, controlling the differences. The conclusion from a bunch of experiments of that type is that single genes make major changes in the course of uh, generating the key traits that have occurred in maize domestication. For example, mutations in a single gene called Tiacente branched 1 can take a single linear-like corn stalk and produce a more bushy plant that looks uh, like Tiacente. Conversely, there's a second gene called TJA1 that plays a key role in seed and fruit case uh, morphology. If you introduce the maize version of the TGA1 gene into Tiacente, those stony fruit cases begin to open up, soften up, you get rid of the stony covering, and you begin to turn the kernels inside out in exactly the way uh, that breeders uh, needed to produce uh, the exposed uh, kernels on an ear of corn. Okay, so I think that's a great example of how by uh, selecting uh, for genetic alterations, you can completely transform uh, the architecture of a plant. How about in animals? And uh, for this example of artificial selection, I'd like to uh, talk about dogs, which I think are a, a wonderful example. Uh, and they're introduced in the next uh, short video. So dogs vary in all sorts of interesting traits, colors, hair textures, sizes, behaviors that are interesting and useful to humans. DNA studies suggest that all those different modern dog breeds are uh, derived from wolves. So wolves have lived near humans for thousands of years, and the earliest Archaeological evidence of domesticated uh, forms of wolves or dogs is found about 10,000 years ago in human settlements. At that time, the skeletons of domesticated dogs looked fairly uniform and similar to wolves. By the time of the Egyptians, you can see these specialized breeds being developed that have long limbs and long muzzles. That uh, breed actually still lives today in an ancient breed called the Saluki. Other breeds have been developed for hunting, retrieving, herding animals. Pointers and retrievers and sheepdogs are great examples of taking ancestral uh, tracking and hunting behaviors that were present uh, in wolves and turning them in to selected behaviors that are useful for humans. So how is it possible to take an ancestral animal and turn it into this broad diversity of different uh, forms? Let's actually uh, listen to a couple of human dog breeders describe how they look at an animal and how they decide what it is they want to do. I think that his neck is a little bit too short. He's got great strength in the neck, but I'd like to have it just a smidgen longer. Um, I also would like to have a little more muscle definition in the rear. We really enjoy the ability to take the gene pool and use it like paints. It's, it's our art. This is my art. I made this beautiful dog that I enjoy. I made her. I chose her sire and her dam. I chose several generations to make this beautiful dog. I'm very proud of her. Okay, so I think that is a great description of what uh, breeders do. They choose dams and sires. They do so for multiple generations. They pick traits that they're interested in, and they develop animals that look different to match uh, what, what they're interested in. So that process extended by lots of breeders over lots of time, has generated an incredible diversity of uh, different dog breeds that are shown uh, here on this slide. We also have a couple of skeletons from different dog breeds uh, here on the stage. This is actually the skeleton of a German Shepherd, and this is the skeleton of a Boston Terrier. You see all sorts of uh, dramatic skeletal differences uh, between the two uh, dog forms. The most obvious is maybe the, the much longer length of the legs here in the German Shepherd uh, than, than the Terrier. There's also dramatic changes uh, in the jaws. So the muzzle of the uh, German Shepherd is much longer than the short muzzle of the Boston Terrier. If you come at the break, you can actually uh, count teeth. There's more molars uh, in the German Shepherd uh, than found here. The length of the vertebral column also differs. There's twice as many vertebrae in the tail of the German Shepherd as found uh, 